My name is Itziola Jones, Literary Arts Program Manager for the Hurston Wright Foundation, and it is my immense honor to introduce to you these three writers who are also going to be joining us this weekend for as instructors, Dr. Tara Betts, Crystal Wilkinson, and Imani Perry. Uh, a few things to note. Uh, thank you all everyone for coming. I wanted to give you all a brief history about the org. Founded in 1990, over the last 30 years through our programming, partnerships, and events, we've discovered, honored, and, mentioned black, and mentored black writers in the world of the literary canon. Our summer workshops are our signature programs, and today marks the kickoff of our 2021 Writers Weekend, which we will be sharing with these three incredible writers. So without much further ado, it is my honor to introduce Dr. Tara Betts. Dr. Tara Betts is the author of Break the Habit, Ark and Hugh, and forthcoming Refuse to Disappear. In addition to her work as a teaching artist and mentor for young poets, she has taught at several universities, including Rutgers University and the University of Illinois Chicago. She recently taught poetry workshops for three years at Statesville Prison via Prison and Neighborhood Arts Project. Dr. Betts is poetry editor at the Langston Hughes Review. She's also in the process of establishing the nonprofit organization to the Wolven Learning Center on the south side of Chicago. From the comfort and safety of your couches, give it up for Dr. Target. Thank you so much, E.T. Uh, thank you to the Hurston Wright Foundation for doing that difficult work of helping African-American letters thrive, especially in these times when we probably need our stories more than ever. Um, and I'm so honored to be here with Amani and Crystal who have been doing this work and have inspired me in so many ways in my own journey. So um, without further ado, I'll start with a poem. Um, since I started out doing a lot of stuff on the open mic and poetry slam scene, I'm gonna challenge myself and read a new, new poem tonight uh, that hasn't been read anywhere else. It's, uh, part of this journey of talking about touch that I've been exploring in some new poems. And it doesn't even have a title yet, but it's, ba it's based on a story that I read about in a book called Touch and what happened to two senior citizens. So, the visibility of your pain remains unseen. Joints swelling into grind of bone against bone, pressed against ghosts of cartilage and ease. Skin, a loose edifice gathering lines along stress fissures. Gray hair feathers the nest of your head, where memory folds into an expanding deck, unplaced for longer stretches than your younger body ever imagined. In the stale storage of an old folks home, a place that suffocates like your last stop. You glimmer in your gray. A smile and a nod awaken some person you forgot inside the hollow of your body. You touch each other's worn hands, revive a withered heat that you thought vacated your bones. Slowly, tenderly, you map each other's skins. A nocturne before dinner, while your friends and neighbors march to meal like obedient children that you raised and hope will visit. You recall how you made them this way, naked and close to someone, and they forget for their own comfort. Tonight, you spoon close, tangle fingers into a gnarled elegance, breathe into each other's slight creaking. You have been laying there in this ancient prayer, older than you will ever be, a nurse finally notices two empty chairs at dinner, a pressed alarm, rooms thrown ajar until you are found indecent, inappropriate, breaking the rules and required to report for dinner from that day onward. Who knew that the touch denied adults led to a scolding fit for children? Who knew shaming would snip a bloom before it fully opened one last time. This one last touch, tinted with shame for this most human act just before you long for it, then curl up, forbidden by the rules 
and then death. And um, I know, such a happy place to start, but I feel like we forget old people love too. Old people are romantic too. That doesn't die as people get older, right? So I was thinking a lot about that. And I was like, how are you going to tell grown people what they can and can't do before dinner? But anyway, um, I'm going to read some other poems. I've been trying to write some new things. I wrote a couple of pandemic poems. Um, one of the things <laughs> that I've really missed is teaching with my students at Stateville Prison who sometimes wrote the most amazing poems or made the most amazing insights that I never missed teaching graduate school because they were just so funny and so witty and so passionate about books. So this is a poem that I wrote for one of them. Um, he's recently been released, so he's the main character in the poem. It's called Small Illuminations. One, Albert is a gentle tower. His arms arched over tabletop like bridge beams or girders. Even if he does not understand everything he reads, he smiles like a good kid, like the kid he probably was 30 some years ago when he was in the wrong car with the wrong people at the wrong time that he will never get back. Two, the attention to detail borders on flawless, unscuffed white sneakers, perfected line fades tucked under precisely folded scullies, immaculate with what you got as a clean, hard fought pride. Three, once a week, I bring crisp folders, a bundle of sharpened pencils with full pink erasers, round and soft as a doll's blush. They rub away small errors, clearing smudges from a page like an actual correction. Four. Oh, are we okay? Drop a line in the chat. I went out for a you second. You get out, but you're back. We're good. Okay, I was like, damn. <laughs> All right, so the last stanza of the poem, four. I look for Albert's easy grin first when I walk into the concrete block classroom, locked in the education building, relieved that the broken window denies the cold like a plea. One brother in blues with thermal sleeves peeking out of what the dull faded ocean of cloth arching over his torso would look like. Okay. A cellmate hands me the slightly worn, safe guarded, staple bound book of poems, the signature resolute and matching letters of a poet's name who strolled into prison like a mother without fear of any child. Margaret Burroughs, more than a decade since she left the cell of her body. I clutch her poems, knowing how they pass from our hands like a prayer. We both smile small illuminations in a dark hell when the cellmate says albert wanted you to have this he got transferred he knew you'd keep it safe so i don't know why things are popping in and out but i hope you guys caught the ending and yes long live dr burroughs there's another event tonight that's going on inspired by her for a PDF, if I can, I'll share that PDF with you guys. Uh, that was published by Miriam Kaba's imprint. So um, this is a poem that I wrote in class with them because I told, it's a prompt that I like to give people. It's kind of partly inspired by Wanda Coleman and thinking about the scars on your body and the, sto the stories behind the marks on your body. And it's called What Skin Keeps. Yes, I have stories about Wanda. Anyway, uh, <laughs> what skin keeps? Skin remains a soft harbor long after infancy recedes. Flesh ruptures 
itches, oozes, scabs, crust, sutures itself back into a flawed song. The mild glimmer above a top lip scraped a few years ago as I flew airborne over a bike's handlebars, face down in the dirt, muddy and in need of stitches. The notch below my ribs on the right where a chest tube pumped air into my defiant lungs. The long, tough arc of keloid from breast to shoulder blade where a surgeon wrestled the tumor, an unwelcome fist away from heart, lungs, and esophagus. A shiny inverted teardrop carved into my left thigh when I clung to a wooden door frame, then leaped to another and missed, losing my grip and hitting the unforgiving corner of a metal bookshelf. The glint on a left pinky toe, almost lost at age five to the brutal clamp of a recliner's undercarriage. This soft harbor, this last blessed boundary, this between blood and raw inside, darker in some places than others, ashen, softened by coconut oil, this skin, scars and all, heals. So, you know, I think it's good. Our, our skin tells some stories, right? Um, I've been, thank you guys. I'm also gonna share, there's, um, I came up, this is what happens during the pandemic is we come up with ideas. <laughs> For new forms. So I came with this idea for a short poetic form. It consists of six lines. So the first four lines all have the same number of syllables. The first stanza is ABAB. -B. So, and the second, the last two lines are two words or less, and they have to be a rhyming couplet. So it's really, really tight. But the thing is, you got to reference an RB song. And what was the lesson you learned from the R&B song? So they're short. I'll read a couple and close with a longer poem and be out. Uh, this one's Pony after Jenny Wine. When the hips roll over him like a wheel that existed before the wheel, friction is its own saddle. Thighs tighten a seal of skin. Ride this pony. A gate thrums, rises, falls, night calls. Soon as I get home, after Faith Evans. When too many flights make me a stranger to my own home, when I start daydreaming about whispers to my pillows, the hunger to be waiting with my bags at the curb comes. Your smile feeds me as I get in while heat blows and billows. I miss simply this. I can see in color after Mary J. Blige. When the hell inside your head breaks, you see the soot wiped away from the window of your life, where dull gives way to sunlight, green, rain slickers and bright boots. The leaded grief, the tonnage depression brings, so you call this pallor for color. I keep thinking Mary J. Blige really was the inspiration for this form. So I'm going to close with this Mary J. Blige 411 and another poem. No, I'll be quiet. Ain't really love. That moment when a woman drops her chin and shakes her head and all that cold seeps from his words, comes icy out his mouth, lets you know how the house been crumbling, the peeling paint, lead, He's a wrecking ball, crushing the rubble in this last bout, a demolition she shunned. So, um, this last poem is um, a short golden shovel. And I'm sure some of you are familiar with the golden shovel. Um, the N words basically traditionally spell out a line from Gwendolyn Brooks. And this one, <laughs> I think is a good affirmation to carry with us through the weekend because as writers, people try to tell us we're nobody and we don't matter or we're not important. Or if you're a woman or if you're a black person, or if you're a person who's queer, like all of those different identities collide with a world that isn't always welcoming. And I kept thinking about 
I don't want nobody to ever tell me I'm nobody. I'll be like, mm, all right. So <laughs> this poem is called Nobody Is Not Driving. So you guys are driving. You're behind the steering wheel. Remember that. Nobody is not driving. Spend a lifetime shunning the word nobody. You have never heard it. Don't know what it is. A half crushed nest of hornets furious. Flight of your refusal. No one calls you nobody. Is only ever matched by someone who hates everything you ever represented. Not those traits you chose, but what makes you people, folks, fam, love, a pound and a fist bump at the door when you're greeted by the least of your kin, who have never seen no nobody belted in your seat, clutching the wheel, driving through your hopefully long, well-lived life by pushing you aside and trying to put you in some fading, forgotten parking lot. This life was never theirs to steer, an empty car. So thank you. And I hope you guys have a very productive weekend. Thank you so much, Tara. Give it up one more time for Tara Betts. Burr, 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 burr. I'm in my living room by myself, but the energy still keeps going. Up next, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you all, Crystal Wilkinson. Crystal Wilkinson is a USA Artist Fellow, is the award-winning author of The Birds of Opulence, winner of the 2016 Ernest J. Gaines Prize for Literary Excellence. Come on, literary excellence, let's go. Water Streets and Blackberries, Blackberries. Her first collection of poems, Perfect Black, will be published in August. Nominated by the John Doss Passos Award, the Orange Prize, and the Hurston Wright Legacy Award, she has received recognition from the Yaddo Foundation, Hedgebrook, Vermont Studio Center for the Arts, the Fine Works Center, Provincetown, and others. She has been nominated for two Pushcart Prizes, and her short stories, poems, and essays have appeared in numerous journals and anthologies, including most recently the Kenyon Review, Story, Agni Literary Journal, Emergence, Oxford America, and Southern Cultures. She currently teaches at the University of Kentucky where she is an associate professor in English in the MFA Creative Writing Program. Please give it up for, for Crystal Wilkinson. Thank you so much. It's so good to be here. It's wonderful to read with Tara and Amani, and it's also wonderful to be back here uh, after so many years uh, to Hurston Wright. I was saying earlier that I was in that first Hurston Wright week that um, Marita and Clyde did in 1996. Uh, so here I am today and I'm so happy to be here. Um, I'm going to read a story that was published in, in Agni and um, you know I'm around a lot of young people uh, and have grandchildren so um, I was rereading Susan Sontag's The Way We Live Now, and she wrote a story in the 80s about the AIDS crisis. And I started thinking about what is the crisis for young people? And of course, um, police brutality came up. So the story is about that. And um, what I've tried to do is, is shrink the story. So I think it, uh, I hope it still makes sense in this short period of time. It was a hard story to write. It's sort of a hard story to read, uh, but it does have a, a turn at the end and I hope you enjoy it. The way we leave now. We thought Kendra was playing about him being shot in the first place, not him. He had good grades, Tika told Freddie, and he was planning to go to college according to Trey because they ran track together. But he did smoke a little weed, Erica pointed out, at least once because she was there but the counselor at school confirmed that he had in fact applied to four universities. He was a finalist for two scholarships, Marie told Phil, which meant he wasn't the kind of dude to just be walking around reckless. That kind of shit ain't him, Kai said and cried when we found out cause him and Kai was tight. He was so little, Sabrina said and slapped the back of her hand against her open palm when she heard the police described him as menacing. Five, seven, one fifty, she said, and shook her head until her box braid slapped across her chest. I heard he had a gun on him, Tanisha said to Trinity, which might mean that you never really know a person or what they're capable of, but Trinity said he didn't have no gun. Dontre, who was there when he got shot, said dude was just holding his cell phone. 
Dontre run his hand over his chin, then said, shit's fucked up. The school kept offering grief counseling and a whole lot of us went just to get out of classes, but Dontre refused. Kendra said she heard Dontre whispering, fuck all of this. Every time the office called him out of homeroom to talk, Dontre went to the guidance office only about scholarships, Marie said to Phil, which meant maybe Dontre was thinking about going to college. Big Hodge at the corner store said, nice and respectful kid, always smiling, cutting up, no trouble at all. And then Big Hodge invited all the neighborhood kids to get a box of hot tamales and a bag of jalapeno potato chips on a discount because that was our homeboy's favorites. But when Big Hodge confirmed all of this during his interview with the television reporter, the manager at the Burger Shack called the station to say he was the one who called the police. Trespassing, the Burger Shack manager yelled into the microphone when the reporter came to the restaurant, flashed a mic and said, ask him why he called the police. Somebody knocked over one of those cardboard candy stands that said proceeds go to the fire department. And that's when Sabrina called her daddy and asked him if it was against the law to run or cuss somebody out. Mr. John reported that a scholarship would be established in our boy's name so somebody could get the education dude wanted for himself. And everybody thought it should be Dontre who got the scholarship. But Sabrina's daddy said it wasn't enough money to support anyone trying to enroll in a reputable college and that our high school should be ashamed of its damn self for disrespecting Miss Marie, Miss Marie and her son like that. And that's when Dontre announced that he was going to get to college on his own. And he said, again, fuck all this. And Kendra walked with him to the counselor's office to ask about Pell Grants. And Kendra whispered, both y'all so smart. And Dondre fell into Kendra's arms and cried in the hallway outside the door to the counselor's office in front of the poster that said RIP with a big picture of our friend smiling wide. Marie said she saw them in the hallway, but she didn't say nothing because they needed a minute. Mr. Eric started wearing a t-shirt with dude's face on the front and his 3.87 grade point average across the back. Did none of, none of us know dude was all about his books until the shirts were made, but we all knew he wasn't no thug and some of us started writing 3.87 in the bathroom stalls, across our three ring binders and on the homeroom desk. According to Camilla, it was DeBron who tagged 3.87 on the side of Burger Shack and on the side of the courthouse. When the police came and lined up along the sidewalk ready to bust heads, Mr. Eric just lifted his hand up and called out our dude's name again, lifting his entire name up to God. And by then a hundred people had come to see what was going on. I wish he could have seen us, Sky said, as we all sat around in the cafeteria eating lunchroom pizza while she told the story with her Afro looking round and perfect as the sun. We started chanting his name too and Dontre looked like he was about to cry and went down the hallway to be by himself and some of us got sent to the office for causing a disturbance. Some of us crowded into the hospital lobby to say our goodbyes even if some of us didn't know him like that. Miss Marie came down to the ICU waiting room to see us all in our purple shirts with dude's picture and 3.87 on them bought by the teen center. Dontre said he was going to the park to play basketball and Ariella and Naz would say later that they saw him across the street from the burger shack, just standing with his arms crossed. Miss Marie asked us all to keep fighting for what's right. Some of us ran down the corridor to the elevator to get out of there and some of us didn't move for a long time. After the rest of us drifted out into the hospital parking lot like stunned zombies, Ariella said, my mama say death make you family. And we all leaned on cars, put our arms around each other, looked off into the space, checked our cell phones in silence until somebody said something stupid that made us laugh. On the last day of school, Maya kept asking everybody if they went to the funeral. Sharice tried to give Dontre the praying for you banner, but he mumbled something under his breath and threw it in the trash. Three weeks later, Tika told Freddie about what happened to Candace at the pool how according to Malik, somebody called the police and said, them kids don't have no passes. They don't live here. But Candace had already gotten permission from her uncle who lived in apartment 12 while he was at work. Malik said when the police came, Candace stood on one of the pool chairs and yelled, my uncle lives here. My uncle lives right over there. That's when the cop tackled her to the concrete and messed up her face then handcuffed her and bent her arms back so far she had to go to the emergency room. 
Tania said, Candace shouldn't have been standing on that chair. She might be a cheerleader, but that cop gave zero fucks about that until her mama came and somebody posted a video on Facebook. Tika told Freddie that Candace had planned to transfer to a performing arts school next year. Trinity said, don't matter if she's a dancer or a cheerleader or a giraffe. She's still a black giraffe, Tania agreed. Kendra announced that she had stopped by Candace's house and that she was improving but depressed. I'd be crazy. Tanaya said, if a cop put his hands on me like that. Later that summer at Anika's birthday party, we were all milling around the yard when dude's sister Tiffany showed up looking like she wasn't getting no sleep, rubbing her fingers across a watch, slouching on her wrist that Dantre said belonged to dude. How's Miss Marie? We all asked. She good, Tiffany said, scratching her eyebrow, still waiting to see what happens with that cop. Ah, girl, we loved him. Trinity said and stepped on everybody's shoes to move in close and give Tiffany a hug. We were all awkward and quiet, but had come to realize in a few weeks what Ariella's mama meant when she said death make you family. Some of us had started to move in closer to Tiffany, needing to hug her or just lay her hands on her shoulders when Candace walked in wearing a bright yellow sundress that glistened against her dark skin. Her arm was still in a sling and she had on heavy makeup, but we could still see the outline of the scrape place along the side of her face. She wore a thick smear of pink lipstick and dark sunglasses, which made her look like a superhero or a soldier home from war, a survivor. So when she made her way toward us, switching like a runway model, we stepped away from Tiffany, stopped crying and started clapping as if Candace had just given a speech or won a prize. Jonisha said, Turn up the music and we started dancing. Dante was in the corner of Anika's yard with his foot pressed up against the fence and stepped out to give dude's sister a hug before he slunk back against the fence. Maya and Anika slung their arms around Candace's neck while Kendra gently placed her hand on Candace's back. Blair walked up on Candace and flashed a flirtatious smile, stroked a mustache he didn't have yet and said, damn queen. Kai whistled through his fingers and all the grown-ups came out of the house to see what was going on. We gave each other dap and watched Candace switch around the yard. We made as much noise as we could. Candace smiled widely, though we could tell something was forever changed. We laughed and danced and clapped and ate because at least in that moment, Ariella's mama was wrong. We didn't want to think about death making us family because we were all alive. Thank you. Thank you so much, Crystal. Give it up one more time for Crystal Wilkinson. Y'all, that was so good and so generous. Oof, I feel so enriched on the inside. And now, last but certainly not least, it is my profound honor to introduce to you all Imani Perry. Imani Perry is a Hughes Rogers Professor of African American Studies at Princeton University and the writer of six books, okay, including the award-winning titles Looking for Lorraine, The Radiant and Radical Life of Lorraine Hansberry and Breathe, A Letter to My Sons. Please make as much noise as you can from the comfort of your couches for Imani Perry. Thank you. Um, I have to say I'm still, um, in the space of meditating on Tara and, and Crystal's just absolutely brilliant writing. So I'm gonna try to get myself recentered, but I am um, so deeply moved um, and so grateful to be here. Um, what I'm going to read is uh, a series of paragraphs that didn't make it into the book that I'm currently in the, in the process of, of, the, of copy editing. Um, the next book is South to it's called South to America: A Journey Below the Mason Dixon to Understand the Soul of a Nation, and it will be out in January. Um, and so, what I'm sharing is is uh, what was part of what was discarded that was hard to let go of, but I felt like I wanted to share something incomplete. I, uh, although I was literally editing up until seven o three or trying to, so I have a little bit of regret. But I feel like since our participants are being vulnerable and sharing their work in progress, I want it to be um, as well. Okay, so. Walking close to midnight in the Walmart 
with that insistent sickly blue brightness against the dark outside that turns everyone sallow and shows every crevice and cake sore is a lesson in the loneliness of poverty born in the shadow of prosperity. Sometimes a person jonesing or tweaking looks you dead in your eyes and smiles a little bit with ashamed courteousness if you aren't a reporter asking them to spill their guts. Sometimes you walk behind a man with his hair plastered to the back of his head, dirty blonde, and he's fussing with his girlfriend and the cursing sounds more like frustration than anger. Sometimes a mama saying that the children ain't getting nothing is meant to sound disciplinary, but comes out sad by mistake. Somebody has bad teeth. You might think about the blood streaming from his mouth and how the ever present bad taste and the feeling of bloating around each tooth can make a person especially miserable when there's nothing to do about it. And how when the dead tooth finally falls out, it might be a relief. I, a black woman witness, am unremarkable in every aisle. No one does a double take in proximity, though my body is always raised, my presence is not alarming. We are all regular folks in a regular place, presumed to be scuffling, as my grandmother would have said it, through life. Walmart is Southern. The Walmart Family Foundation, a charitable giving arm of the richest company in the world, affirms my claim that the Southern region is the true heartland of America. They say, in official documents, that the heartland reaches much further south than the Midwest, all the way down to the coasts of Alabama and Mississippi. Its most recent report on the heartland describes their work as follows. This report is intended to help heartland leaders and citizens get on the same page about the region's current condition and its trajectory at a crucial time. I'm curious about the heartland they sketch. It doesn't include all of the South, but enough of it to be noteworthy. Perhaps that comes from Sam Walton's own story. Born in Oklahoma, he settled in Arkansas and opened his first store there in Bentonville. While he was living, Sam Walton prided himself on being a regular, church-going, decent man. He graduated from college and went to work at Penny's. In World War II, he served in the Army, ascending to the rank of captain. It was after the war that he first entered into the world of what was called variety stores. His success was attributed to a $20,000 loan in 1945 and key insights into how people lived. With a smaller profit margin, he decided to build stores that would provide everything one could want in one location. For people in rural areas or small towns, the combination of good prices and convenience were hugely appealing. Add to that the practice of loss leaders selling some items at cost or below cost and offsetting the loss with other goods grew their business further. But maybe it wasn't Walton's personal story, but simple observation. The production of wealth, the mastery of exploitation, the engine of markets, the gospel of prosperity, these are things at which the South has always been cutting edge. The very idea of the supermarket began in the South. Piggly Wiggly, founded in Memphis in 1916, was the first grocery that allowed people to wander the aisles and gather their own goods with prices marked on them, rather than giving a list to a clerk. Removing the need for a clerk cut costs for the store and increased the consumer's purchasing. You could just snatch things off the shelf as the feeling hit you. And they gave customers shopping carts so you could buy more than what fit in a bag or your hands. And then there was Kresge, the company that would give us Kmart in 1962, which was also started in Memphis in 1916. And of course, dollar stores. Convenience, affordability, and feeding desire are hallmarks of how the South has fed the growth of retail in the United States. Walmart is simply the most successful example, having effectively eaten up local grocery stores and competing companies. In many places, it is all that is left. Though Walton for, was from Oklahoma and started his business in Arkansas, it's worth noting that there was little geographic distance between his home and his empire. Nowadays, Oklahoma is the Midwest, Arkansas is the South, but they're so close, I guess they slip into each other. The Arkansas Territory was created out of the southern part of the Missouri Territory in 1819 with a cutout 
for the, Miss for the Missouri Blue Thiel, a wheat farming white populated region. Arkansas territory thus included all of the present state of Oklahoma south of this latitude. It was a rough and tumble place that got its final boundaries in 1828. The set white settlers had forced the Quapaw out to, their, to a reservation in Louisiana in the 1820s, but they returned to their homeland by 1830, then forcibly removed again within a few years. Arkansas had by then become like much of the South, a slave and plantation based cotton economy. Enslaved people in Arkansas picked cotton, but the men were also taken to the southern tip of the state to clear swamps, living on a diet of fatback and cornmeal and eaten up by mosquitoes in the humid, disease-ridden environment. They died at a remarkably high rate. All that to say, Oklahomans sometimes get counted as Southern. For example, most literary historical accounts, Ralph, by most literary historical accounts, Ralph Ellison is Southern, and by most country music accounts, Reba McIntyre is too. In fact, when Reba McIntyre covered Vicki Lawrence's That's the Night That the Lights Went Out in Georgia, and I heard her say lawyer, the way every white Southerner I've ever heard say it, I thought to myself, as much as I love the original, I'm glad a Southerner covered this song. But I digress. Walmart is agent of tragic poetry that has historically followed the traditional Southern rules of who can be in charge and who works and who is to be reviled. Walmart is a huge employer and it protects the logic of the South. No collective bar bargaining. Public assistance forms are offered alongside application. They've been sued for discrimination a whole bunch of times. They are a vexing place. They make life easier and also make it harder. And they have spread their model across the world. This too is Southernization. Some years ago, I noticed that people on social media were sharing images from a website titled The People of Walmart. It mocked them. Poor people, but especially poor Southern folks were fodder. Photographs of people in Walmart in states of undress or personal crisis were served up as humor. We, the viewers, were enlisted to humiliate them. Now, don't get me wrong, Southerners laugh at these folks too, even Southerners from the same walk of life. The eccentricity is built into the South uh, and has caused for a great deal of laughter, but you can be laughing at the same folks, but not laughing at the same thing. There are plenty of poorly shaped garments, house shoes, snacks to buy at Walmart. You can also buy guns and gun storage units, cameras and tree stands to help hunters locate the hunted, decoys to confuse the game, and for the more, more old fashioned archers, bows and arrows. Walmart is a theater, a scene of greed and excess, so much stuff and the characters, the people of Walmart dressed up their fantasies of who they can be for a while. I suppose there is something jarring when stepping back from the edge of fantasy, one realizes that all of this consumption is not a fantastical escape. It is a mirror. Arkansas has the highest rate of gun ownership in the nation at 57.9% of people owning a firearm. Other, other southern states aren't far behind, 48.9 for Alabama, 54.2 in Virginia. Walmart itself stopped selling handguns and ammunition in response to a mass murder at a Walmart in El Paso that targeted Latinos. The tragedy elicited horror and heartbreak. It seemed to shake something up in corporations, briefly at least, but it is important to know that you can be crying at the same event, but not crying at the same thing. We're all killing people, quietly, every day. Invisibility is not that much different than a shot. Maybe this is how I can explain it to you. We are all, or nearly all, the people of Walmart made in the image of loss leading and trying to keep up and being ridiculous and mocked. All of our cracks show and pants slip and bellies hang over while we try to stay afloat. Just because we don't want to see it doesn't make it anything other than plain as day. Thank you. We'll give it up one more time for Imani, y'all, and Tara Betts and Crystal Wilkinson. Make as much noise as you can from the comfort and safety of your couches. Okay. Um, could I have all three of the of our of our wonderful readers back on the center stage?
Beautiful. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so I think we have to wrap up soon. But does anyone in the in the question in the uh, chat have any questions for our readers? I think I see two right here. Um, from Michelle Furimani, I always thought that the correct be open in Memphis simultaneously with its HQ ultimately being in Michigan. What distinguishes Craigslist from men from a Memphis store? Oh, well, I'm not sure, you know, so, so yeah, I mean, it, the stories with a lot of these corporations, which is, you know, this, this doesn't get fleshed out and partly because it's, it's cut out, but that many of them are, they become, they're, they're built of two, either two locations or two smaller companies that join. And so the genealogies are really complex, but the model of the variety store, there are, Mich there are Midwest models, but the model of the variety store that rests upon the model of the, um, of the supermarket beforehand becomes, that is a Southern innovation on the one hand and two, Oftentimes those who start those kind of companies in the Midwest are people who have migrated, white Americans who've migrated from the South. So there's something about the idea of that kind of space that has to do with the, you know, kind of general stores that also have to do with actually the way um, businesses are structured on plantations themselves. So it's a longer, more complicated story than we probably have time for. But yes, that's a good point. Okay, wonderful. Uh, Crystal, I have a question for you. Um, your writing is gorgeous, obviously. It's that that's a given. But there's a way in which you're able to take characters and you you are able to create these tender spaces in places where there's often violence, especially when we think about the public school system and how that often leads um, disenfranchised youth, notably young black men, into the prison pipeline system. My question is, um, in your this might be a little too personal, and feel free not to answer. But where in your personal life do you draw inspiration from insofar as creating these complex characters um, that may often seem fraught, but find themselves in these sort of predicaments where they have to find a way to fight themselves out, so to speak. And let me know mm. if I rephrase my question. Um, well, I mean, it's it's simple. I'm a, I'm a mama, I'm a grandmother, I'm a teacher. You know, I'm a professor at UK, but I also go into the community and, um, and teach kids. So, um, you see these complexities uh, and the pain of our children all the time. And so that's where the inspiration comes from mm -hmm. because we get to see all the violence and we get to see uh, the, the bad things that the public sees that they do, but we don't often see the tenderness that they have with each other. And we never see the aftermath of a shooting and, and, and how it impacts the children in that community. So it, it is personal, uh, it's very personal, but thank you for the question. Thank you for the answer. Uh, Tara, this question is for you. Um, so I, one thing you and I definitely have in common is that we both taught in prisons um, and it's definitely shaped our pedagogy and how we approach um, teaching. And I think I can definitely agree with you passionately that I love teaching in prisons maybe more than in graduate programs. Um, how has teaching in in, um, in prisons and maybe uh, low security facilities, how has that influenced your writing? How has it also influenced the ethics of your writing as well? Um, if it has. I think in some ways it makes me think about what about language is dangerous to the state? Mm -hmm. I think about that a lot because I think about what I can no longer or what I can't bring into the prison, right? Um, for example, one semester I was teaching Ames Césaire's Notebook of a Return to a Native Land because they were like, we want to look at something in language that's just totally different from everything else we've read. I said, all right, I'm going to bring something crazy. <laughs> And they were just like, okay. And so when they looked at it, they're like, oh my God, what do we do with the opening page? And I was like, read it for the feeling. I said, read it out loud, you know? And there's this line on the first page where they're talking about the pigs of the state and everything else. And I'm like, I'm glad I put it in the middle of the reader because everything I bring in gets submitted to the warden and they approve whether or not I can bring it in. So. 
things that you would normally do in another classroom get policed in ways that don't get policed in a normal classroom. But also just like paying attention to small things, which I've always tried to do in a poem. Like what's a small thing that conveys the feeling and, and thinking about things in a meditative way because the place where I'm at isn't minimum security. I'm in a maximum security prison that was the last, it had the last remaining Panopticon style structure until 2016. Hmm. So it's, it's extremely repressive and for them, <laughs> um, just thinking about that whole thing of what you are grateful for and trying to create some little corner of space where you can just think because they're stacked. Like the one time I went into a block, I think it was like five or six floors. Mm -hmm. There's at least 15 cells mm -hmm. on each floor. And there's two grown men in a tiny room that's smaller than my bedroom. And it makes you think about that. Like, how do you find mental space where there's constant noise in a crowded, compact space where people don't even think you deserve certain rights as a human being? Absolutely. You know, but it does make me think about writing like, you better get your hustle together, do it. You know, there are people who do it, they're in these horrible circumstances they shouldn't even be in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you for that. We have a few more questions and we gotta wrap up the evening. Um, this question is for you, Imani. Thank you for all your powerful readings. I'm wondering how you decide to cut sections you read to us. Do you feel as though the things you convey in this section were addressed in other parts of the book or did you just have to let them go? So I love that question because I feel like it points to a big part of what I think is important about nonfiction, at least for me, in the in the sense that, you know, there's nonfiction writers are given a lot of leeway to be indulgent in ways that are at always um, a risk of becoming a being make the the risk is that craft becomes less important. So if you think about, you know, the you know, both Tara and, and Crystal's read, the, the, the economy of words has mm -hmm. this incredible resin, right? Like, so the choice of, you know, not, so for example, the choice of not saying this character is this, or this person is that, right? So you hear these voices of these kids and you get, you learn their personalities through the series of sentences, mm -hmm. but not necessarily through with description, right? Or, you know, in the initial poem that that um, that that Tara read, where you know what's happening, right? Like, and it does not like this person is this age and this per right. And so, for me, the process of cutting is actually about learning um, uh, all the things that you know about these people in this story don't have to be in it, and that is counterintuitive, I think, often for the way we think about nonfiction. But it's actually essential to learning how to tell a story that people want to stick with. So Walmart isn't gone, but it appears uh, in sort of in the middle of things instead of having its own section, right? So these, I think almost all the points are in there, but they unfold in in, in story section. So, um, and really the point is not so much about, well, I mean, Walmart is the largest country in the world, so that a company in the world, so that's important, but it is about this idea of growth and prosperity and exploitation, which is at the heart of the region, because it's, you know, it's built on the slave, pushing people off their land and the slave trade and building wealth through absolute devastation of human lives, right? So Walmart is learned, learned it's, you know, at the end, it's like the way of doing things is rooted in the culture of the economy and the politics of, then that really is, becomes the whole country, right? Like it moves the country about. So that's, yeah. Wonderful, thank you so much. We have one more question and then we will convene for the night. I don't know if you answered this already, Crystal. Um, how do you keep the voices of all the characters separate and unique? There were many voices, but it didn't feel overwhelming. 
Yeah, I think there are probably even more than you heard because I had cut some out. I think there's about 20 characters in that in that story. Um, and I had to make a map like I went through. I mean, it sounds, you know, it's in their voices mostly. And it sounds uh, I, hopefully, you know, somebody who's in their 50s where it was able to somewhat create, um, you know, I was 16 once. So I tried to 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 create them uh, of their age, but I kept a map uh, for each character. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and and what was going on. So it was kind of hard. So I had to keep a really long map while I was writing the story. Wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone. We unfortunately lost our internet connections, but I want you all to give, uh, oh, she's still in the chat, thank God. Um, I want you all to give um, our wonderful, lovely readers a big round of applause from the comfort of your houses, your homes, your apartments, your futons, and have a good night. And we will hopefully see you at the meet and greet with Marita and Tope. Thank you so much, everyone.